breaking the wall between digital and physical. How digital fabrication gives birth to programmable reality. Neil Gershenfeld, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. On the 9th of November 1989, I was just starting as a junior fellow at Harvard, developing computer interfaces for virtuosic musical instruments, which I didn't think at the time had anything to do with the fall of anything. Thank you. On this very emotional day, it's very therapeutic to spend it with a room full of thoughtful people making such a profound difference. And I want to share with you what I think is a hopeful connection between science, technology, and some of the root causes of the election. So I want to break the boundary between digital and physical. Claude Shannon wrote the best master's thesis ever, where he digitized communication. We have the internet. John von Neumann digitized computation. We have the digital revolution that so much of this meeting is about. But the last one doesn't fit. At 1952, MIT made the first computer-controlled manufacturing machine. This was the first real-time computer connected to a machine to turn the cranks to make a part. So that's the birth of digital fabrication, meaning a computer controlling a machine to make a thing. But there's no information in the parts. It's just metal whacking at metal. The most advanced 3D printer today is the same. You squirt out uh, material. You add it rather than cut it, but the information is in the computer, not in the materials. So we have to change a lot to, to fix that. To start, I'm happy to take credit with the observation that computer science is the worst thing to happen to computers or to science. <laughs> because it's based on a fiction that software is in a pretend world and computing is in a physical world, much of what's hard and interesting about computing is at that boundary. As background, one of my students created all the computing infrastructure for Facebook. Another one of my students created all the computing infrastructure for Twitter, and that's because to do that, you can't believe in the separation of software and hardware. You have to think about dollars, watts, and pounds becoming information. And so we're essentially redoing all of computer science from scratch, from the physics on up to the applications. So you can zoom through computer science in a way that respects physics from the individual device degrees of freedom all the way up to applications. And this has all sorts of implications for security and efficiency and scalability. But more than that, once you compute in a way that recognizes physics, you can use physics. And so that's led us to do things like um, part of a collaboration where we design cells from scratch to make living organisms um, among the first complete comp quantum computations that used quantum mechanics to compute faster than classical. You'll hear more about that from Brigida. Um, we made computers that use analog device degrees of freedom to solve digital problems much more efficiently than digital ones. This was the birth of the idea of an internet connected to things. And you can make computers where the bits transport atoms, so computers can influence the world directly, not indirectly. So these are parts of computers that work on physics transporting materials. And that leads up to this. The real revolution isn't additive or subtractive. You might have heard a lot about 3D printing. It's digital versus analog in the construction. You're digital. You're made from 20 parts. And what's remarkable about those 20 parts, the amino acids, is they're not remarkable. They're basic or acidic, hydrophobic or hydrophilic, and by composing them, you create your complexity in just the way Lego works. Think about Lego. The child doesn't need a ruler. The geometry comes from the parts, so they make something bigger than themselves. Um, the tower is more accurate than the child because the Lego detects and corrects error. You can join Lego bricks made out of dissimilar material. And when you're done, you don't put Lego in the trash. You reuse it. That's exactly how you work. And those are exactly the properties that Shannon and von Neumann taught us. They're codes in construction, not describing what you make, codes in what you make. And so we're making molecular Lego to make programmable molecular machinery. Um, in the bottom, in the middle, you see nano Lego. That's a, a, about 100 nanometers, so tens of atoms across. And those are to make assemblers that assemble integrated electronics, not with billion-dollar chip fabs, but with a tabletop process that's reversible so you can unbuild as well as build to make um, uh, so you, rather than technical trash, 
on up to assemblers that make parts of airplanes to uh, uh, spaceships. You might have seen a news story last week that came out where we showed how to make assemblers with robots that link loops of carbon fiber to make airplanes that can change shape. And in doing that, instead of billions of dollars of supply chain to make these giant airplane parts, you link little tiny carbon fiber Lego to make giant uh, aero structures out of it. So across the whole range of manufacturing, putting codes into construction. And that's leading up to the most ambitious project at the heart of this program is developing an assembler that assembles assemblers out of the parts that it's assembling. <laughs> And it turns out that's the heart of the scalability. And it ends up looking a lot like biology. In biology, there's primary structure, which is the code of what to make. And it's a code just like a modern code. There's secondary structure, which is the shapes the amino acids fold in. Tertiary structure is the functional elements they make. And then quaternary structure are the machines those grow into, like the sensors in your eye or the motors in your muscles. And what we're doing is we're taking about 20 part types, conducting, insulating, semiconducting, assembling them into functional elements, making modules out of them that make systems. And so it's just like amino acids, but it's now reducing all of technology down to 20 parts. And the scalability comes from once assemblers make assemblers, you then get exponential ring up in capacity. Ribosomes are slow. They run at one molecule a second. But because ribosomes make ribosomes, you can make you or an elephant. And then the same thing is true here. And so in turn, we have to make a, a new, whole new workflow. This is a design tool for designing assemblers that assemble assemblers, where you make robots out of parts composed in hierarchical structures um, to then design robots. And so this is sort of like designing life, but in engineered systems. And what all that adds up to is we had mainframe computers, mini computers, hobbyist computers, personal computers. We're now recreating that history. The mainframes of fabrication are the 1952 NC Mill at MIT. I'm about to tell you about the mini computers. The hobbyist computers are we do a lot of work on machines that make machines for rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping. And I just sketched the research roadmap up to the Star Trek replicator. A few decades of work to literally the replicator. What you should learn from this slide is first, so the picture on the left is Kernighan and Ritchie at Bell Labs, Bell Labs inventing Unix. That's when modern computing happened. Um, the internet, video games, word processing, all of that happened not after the iPhone, but decades before. Decades before it was clear that was happening. That's exactly the moment we're at today. And the other thing you should note is when in the transition to the personal computer, all of the incumbent industries that fail thought it was a toy. And that's the moment we're at today. So we're right in the middle of that evolution. And so the way I backed into that is for the National Science Foundation, for outreach on the research I described, we started setting up community fab labs. And so it's about the cost and complexity of a mini computer. It includes a 3D printer. But that's actually one of the least used tools. It's the range of digital fabrication machines that turns data into things and things into data. So that's one investment air Iceland. In the lower left, you can see once you have those tools, all the sorts of things you can make with them. Uh, boats, bicycles, furniture, consumer electronics, um, solar house, production tooling, not made in a factory, not made in a research lab, just made in, with these community digital fabrication tools. And then we had an accident, which is we opened one of those for outreach. They've been doubling every year and a half for a decade, and there's 1,000. So for a decade, we've had a Moore's law of the doubling of these tools. And there's every reason to expect that doubling to continue. This is happening now. It's not a prediction for the future. So we had bright kids falling off educational cliffs when they encountered this. So we started a project called the Fab Academy, teaching how to make almost anything. That grew into George Church at Harvard teaches how to grow almost anything. Oliver Eliasson is adding a class through this on why to make almost anything. How do you think about why we make what we make? Uh, here's a class project. This was done in a fab lab in a forest, Valdora, outside Barcelona, that works largely off-grid. And this was a student. He wanted to make food. His skills on the first day was a sketch. Now he's learning design tools. Then he's learning laser cutting, prototyping, large format machining, making a bigger version, um, uh, plumbing instrumentation. Um, 
Again, this is a student project as he's mastering the skills. Around this point, he's starting to learn to design electronics, interface sensors, do embedded programming. So here he's designing the controllers. Then he's interfacing them to the system. And round about week 16, he's eating the lettuce sufficiently made in his aquaponic system. And every part of that, again, wasn't done as a business, it wasn't done as a startup, it's not as research, it's just personal fabrication. The killer app for digital computing is personal computing. This is now personal fabrication. Um, there's a great network of fab labs in Germany. A number of the props here came from uh, German fab labs. This, uh, let me introduce uh, Karsten Nibbe from the Camp Linfort fab lab. Uh, this was, uh, these were all just projects in the how to make class. This was a student who wanted to make a, his own video game rather than playing or buying video games. This was a robotic prosthetic hand. Um, let's see, if all goes well, and I don't run over the wire, um, this, then that. This is a motorized scooter for personal mobility. And um, all of these are done as personal fabrication projects. And what makes it work is you can think of MIT as a mainframe. You go there and get processed. You can think about online classes as time sharing, like the BitNet, you're a terminal. The way this works is it's like an internet for learning. Students have peers with work groups, with mentors, in local labs, with tools. Then we link them globally with video and content sharing. The world is full of bright inventive people. What they're missing is access to the means. Once you cross digital computing and computation with fabrication, you get to bring the campus to the student, not the student to the campus. Um, so in turn, that's led to more surprises. If you can create, let's see, this, for example, is a student, rather than buying a lab, who wanted to make lab equipment in the lab, to make labs that make more labs. Once you can do stuff like that, I'm showing at the top Barcelona's architect. Great design sense, 50% youth unemployment, whole generation can't work. Again, at the heart of what the election was about. What they're doing is each of those flags is one of these labs going into Barcelona. And at the top, I'm showing the mayor starting a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. The idea is instead of products coming in from a long supply chain and trash going to trash dumps, they want the bits to come and go freely, but the atoms to stay. So in the same way urban infrastructure is electricity and clean water, urban infrastructure becomes the means to create, the means to turn data to things, things to data. Um, we ran one of these labs at the White House, right outside the Oval Office, celebrating making, but more than that, making the point that the new jobs aren't coming back to the old factories. If anybody can make anything anywhere, the whole notion of what is work, what is money. Rather than doing something you don't want to do to get money to then buy something you want, if you can create it, it fundamentally changes the nature of work, the nature of money, right at the heart of what this is all about. I'll just play a little bit of this. Uh, audio? Um, if there was audio you'd hear, this is the remaining physicist in Congress, uh, Bill Foster. And he's explaining legislation he made to provide universal access to do um, digital fabrication on community scales in the United States in just the way Barcelona is doing it. Getting at the root causes of the divergence, not by trying to create old jobs again, but realizing the technology turning data to things and things to data changes the notion of work. In turn, that's led to things like with the White House, we ran one of these labs at the UN when the Sustainable Development Goals were launched, the biggest gathering of heads of state ever. And the point was to show not just the goals, but the solution. And if you start going through the list of energy and nutrition, um, they all rest on the ability to turn data to things and things to data. The projects you heard from the lab a few minutes ago, what's limiting isn't the people, it's the means to do it. And so the Sustainable Development Goals need these tools. That led to a collaboration uh, with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Committee of Red Cross to make a global humanitarian lab, which is taking this global lab network and overlaying a virtual lab for humanitarian response where you can send data and then produce on demand what you need locally. And finally, that all adds up to this. This is uh, from the bonus material on the movie The Martian, where at 20th Century Fox, we did this session 
with NASA, the White House, and the studio on the true science of how you go to Mars. And what I'm explaining is to go to Mars, you don't need to redo the Industrial Revolution. Um, I can make, um, the vendor I buy resistors from stocks 500,000 types. I can make them with three parts. With about three more pipe parts, I can make the rest of semiconductor electronics. And it's about 20 parts to make all of technology. And so at heart, this is really getting at what are the minimum building blocks to bootstrap a technological civilization at this intersection of digital communication, computation, and fabrication. So the messages are, the digital revolution as you know it is over, but what's coming is the much more profound one of programming reality, bringing computer science into physical science. The research roadmap leads up to the replicator, and the profound impact is anybody can make almost anything anywhere, which completely changes the notion of what is an economy, what is education, what is work. That's the challenge, that's the opportunity. Thank you.